The Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday, Tuesday, casual Tuesday, Wednesday, casual hump day, Thursday, casual thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, casual Shabbat, the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. June 29th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. It's Casual Friday, folks. I am wearing my soft-collared shirt, <laughs> as is the case on Fridays. Parazumbas. Joining me in studio today for Casual Friday, Nomiki Konst. Hi. <laughs> Not <I'll>, casual. <laughs> also on the program, Country Braces for the Supreme Court and Handmaid's Tale crossover episode. Meanwhile, in a Baltimore Five Dead in a shooting at a local newspaper... ICE agents join the Abolish ICE movement. And over 550 people arrested in protests in the Capitol protesting the U.S. policy of kidnapping immigrant children. And as the State Department releases a report that says its so-called child separation program increases trafficking, mass protests tomorrow... More information at FamiliesBelongTogether.org. New reports, Trump undercutting the EU and, I don't know if I have a problem with this, the WTO. And speaking of civility, there are still nearly two dozen states in this country where you can get fired for being gay. As half of LGBTQ folks not out at work. All this and more on today's program. And yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in studio with us today. And it's always fun to have people in studio. Um, Nomiki Konst, she is an advisor to Our Revolution, um, formerly TYT. Um, and also, uh, you sat or sit on the commission. What is the, the, the technical name for this commission? The technical name is... <laughs> The DNC, Democratic National Committee, Unity Reform Commission. Okay, and this was a commission that was set up um, at the uh, 2018... 16. Oh, Jesus Christ. It was two years ago. It was. Um, <laughs> DNC to basically um, reform some of the practices of the DNC that people had issue with, uh, obviously, and larger issues, and uh, with the way that they were running the primary uh, in that it was exclusionary. And there was some news this week, uh, so very fortuitous to have you in in studio. I was supposed to be here last week, and then I I canceled on you for... And it's better. It's better, because now we have you after this has been resolved. Plus, I also have to say... You're the first person I think we've ever had in studio who, like, even had the consciousness of saying, which one is my camera? <laughs> I think... Uh, and you know what? I'm, I don't even realize I'm on camera right now. That's the bad part. Well, I'm checking my phone. No, and... that's exactly the way we roll here. Uh, you, uh, Michael, Brooks <laughs> generally, Michael Brooks generally sits there and his phone. people are very concerned if he's not <laughs> checking his phone. Um, all right. I, I want to get into that stuff, but sure. let's I want, let's start the show off because you're also um, you've been uh, heavily involved in in New York politics for years, yeah. uh, and I, I wanted to start with this clip uh, we have of uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, who was on, who's already a national I can't figure. Believe, this is amazing, and um, she was on. Uh, Colbert last night explaining what her democratic socialism or what democratic socialism, I should say, means to her. Uh, This is clip number two 
And um, let's let's hear that now. Democratic districts. So there's a good shot that you're going to go to Congress, while not guaranteed. Oh, e- you said you pause it for one second. We should just say that her opponent in the general election, the Republican, he is a men's rights advocate. <laughs> He's also raised zero money. That yes. was the story today. Zero donations in the last week. People well, don't want to bet on a losing horse. Yes. <laughs> well, wait, wait till this message of men's rights advocacy gets out. <laughs> and so before we judge. But here is uh, Colbert. You might be able to get people to get on board with your agenda. What is your agenda? Because you describe yourself as a democratic socialist. And that's not an easy term for a lot of Americans. What is the meaning of that for you? What does socialist mean to you? For me, so for me, uh, democratic socialism is about really uh, the value for me is that I believe that in a modern, moral and wealthy society, no person in America should be too poor to live. That's what I think. Seems simple. Seems pretty simple. So what that means to me is, um, so what that means to me is healthcare as a human right. Um, it means that every child, no matter where you are born, should have access to a college or trade school education if they so choose it. And um, you know, I think that no person should should be homeless um, if if we can have public structures and and public policy to allow for people to have homes and food and lead a dignified life in the United States. Super scary stuff. Super oh scary stuff. Um, and and there she is on on Colbert and Jamie. You were saying that the in the wake of her election. There was a huge surge in DSA membership. Yeah, um, I see this. Uh, this is a f- very uh, definitely verified tweet from a Washington Post reporter. He said uh, the Democratic Socialists of America report their biggest single day jump in membership ever following Ocasio 2018's Victory Tuesday with over a thousand people joining in 24 hours. And it was our biggest bump uh, ever so far, bigger than uh, the bump after Trump's election, as well as the bump after Disrupt J20, um, right ar- around a similar time, which was about 800 each. And we're now over 40,000 members. Wow, that's double, I feel like it was Nationwide, in which is just fucking crazy and cool as hell. And, you know, I've been an electoral skeptic in the past in terms of how uh, these kinds of tactics are going to serve our long-term horizon of transitioning to a socialist society built around human needs and not profits. But um, one key goal, and I just reread the uh, electoral strategy document, so I made sure I knew what I was talking about. Hmm. Like one really important task facing us right now is to build our base and make contact with more of the working class. And that is clearly happening based on our work with Ocasio-Cortez. And I hope it'll continue to happen. So got to give credit where credit's due. And where, I mean, uh, Nomi, from your perspective, like, where, where does this fit in in terms of New York politics? I mean, uh, how much, what are the implications for, for New York politics seem to me to be pretty big um, when you're looking at um, uh, uh, Cynthia Nixon, who's running against uh, Cuomo. How much does it, how much impact does it have in terms of New York? It was earth shattering. I'll give you an example. Other than the fact that the speaker, Corey Johnson, came out and this is New York politics is like 12 dimensional chess. So bear with me a little bit. But I know people love process. It's real fun right now. It's right. like the new it thing. DSA just sits there for three hours and talks process. It's great, actually. But that's where all the stuff is hidden is in the process. So the new speaker of, of the city council got his position through Joe Crowley. That Joe Crowley, who is also the head of the Queen's machine, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the Queen's Democratic machine, which is very important in New York politics. Joe Crowley was one of the signers on this independent Democratic conference deal to make those those. He backed the IDC, essentially. OK, and let me just tell people the IDC is a group of like uh, six, uh, eight, eight, eight Democrats, away. ostensibly Democrats who caucus with the Republicans, really in exchange. I mean, it's sort of amazing how brazen it is. It's literally in exchange for Money. Yeah. Uh, Like, we're going to give you a bigger office. We're going to give you resources. And New York politics is the the line between I I, I don't I'm not familiar with the laws, but it feels like you can get money 
for your office as a state senator and use it to buy yourself stuff. Uh, I mean, it basically feels well, like it, it, larger it, offices, uh, you know, the, 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 the communication structure of the IDC, who now works for the Republicans, she was getting paid more than twice what the senators were being being paid. Yeah, it's shocking. It's a it's a, just a yeah. huge slush fund that they were just given to caucus with the Republicans. And Andrew Cuomo not only sort of gave his blessing, but almost like he midwifed invented, it. He and, invented the IDC he and actually designed it. And this was a way for him to avoid having to ever sign legislation that two houses of Democrats in New York state, a fairly liberal state, would be sending him because he didn't want to taint his future prospects as a uh, president, ostensibly thinking that he was going to run in 1993, I guess. And not to mention, it's not just that he was doing this, this, um, you know, 90s era-esque Clintonian game, right? Triangulation. He also was using the fact that the Senate was holding up the Republican the Republican-led Senate, because these Democrats were caucusing with Republicans, he was using them to block any sort of ethics reform. We have the loosest campaign finance laws in this country, so he is taking advantage of these things called the LLC loopholes, which basically LLCs can give a, an extraordinary amount of money. You can set up 150 LLCs. Now, who does that? Real estate Real interests estate, do that. Yes. And so he has been raising, he's $31 million in his coffers. There is a legal way for him to use that money and move it into a super PAC to support his presidential campaign. Right. And that is what p- is being buried in all of this noise. But just to go back to your original point, because this is, this is really important, how democratic socialism has affected New York State and how it's going to affect the DNC. Corey Johnson, the speaker, who's, who's young, he's, uh, he's openly gay, LGBTQ, he has AIDS, he, um, he's HIV, excuse me, I shouldn't... <laughs> He has, he's HIV positive. Okay. Um, he, so he's been very open about his experience and transformative. He went out and he backed the no IDC candidates, all the candidates running against the IDC members, going against Joe Crowley, who got him his position just a few months ago. Wow. Okay. So that happened just two days ago, right? I had a meeting with a lawmaker in New York State. There's a lot of lawmakers, so I don't want to give this away. But somebody who you would never think in a million years would ask me this. First thing this person said to me when I sat down and had coffee with him yesterday, because everybody wants to understand who she is. Right. He says, I'd like to join DSA. <laughs> I said, what? You know, they now see it as, oh my gosh, it's this, it's this Imprimatur that is going to, right. They're yeah. going to organize for us, but it's, yeah, the politics weren't that far off. It's just, it was such a foreign concept. And, and frankly, the, the, the what Joe Crowley, he, he received all these endorsements from unions and the unions have been a line of defense for these machine politicians, but they didn't deliver. And it's not that the union members didn't deliver. The union leadership is very different in New York State. It's it's complicated. It's it's very highly transactional. Very and so uh, you'll see, and uh, we saw this with with Zephyr Teachout's run, and we see this with Cynthia Nixon's run against uh, Cuomo. Uh, they make a calculation we cannot afford because of the highly transactional nature and and opaque nature of the politics. We can't afford to to mess with Cuomo because he will. And yeah. and down the line, the, 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 he will uh, screw us. And he has in the yeah. past. Yeah. He he went out in an all-out war against unions just six years ago after yep. he was elected. Teachers unions in particular. There were the, – the teachers union in New York had put up billboards calling out Andrew Cuomo for being against unions and teachers. And now they have a friendship again. Sure. It's, it's a very complicated relationship. So I wouldn't – you know, the, the unions aren't supporting or turning people out. I don't know if that's intentional or if it's just the weakening of unions because of Andrew Cuomo, but it's essentially hurting even the establishment Democrats who rely on them for support. And so um, there are people sort of um, uh, fishing around for another base of like uh, that will generate boots on the ground, essentially, yep. and and do this work. I mean, what level of I mean, because you spend a lot of time with with politicians like this, how sophisticated are they? Like how or I should let me put it this way. <laughs> I don't want to ask how stupid are most of them, yeah. but 
It strikes me that the, that's the way the calculation is. It's like, oh, that is a shiny thing over there that looks like it could work for me. And there's no other implications, really, or it's just like, how can I position myself? Because I feel to a certain extent we see a lot of this, broadly speaking, in the Democratic Party. Right. And, and I just don't pay attention to the Republican Party in the same way, although I think that they are actually the, the lunatics now run the asylum. Uh, in the Republican Party for a while, for, for decades, I think that they they would kowtow to them. And then at one point they they just became them um, in the Democratic Party, at least in, in from the my perspective, run our asylum, too. Well, yes, they, they but, run they're the chessboard. Different, but they're di- right. But they're different ones. Right. I mean, like they they do not the 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 base is pushing the party to the left mm-hmm. in a way that it has not in uh, at least in the better part of my lifetime and certainly the more so in the past five, 10 years than I've saw, you know, in the decades before that, Mm -hmm. um, how how much of it is even like an awareness of what they're adopting or how much of it is just like, this is where the energy is. I'm going there. I think that for those who have political ambitions, um, and it's not going to cost them anything right now. And and a perfect example would be all these more neoliberal younger Uh, senators who are lining up for Medicare for All and for uh, Bernie's policies. It really doesn't cost them anything right now because they're not the majority. They don't have to take a vote, right. Yeah, exactly. They're not the majority, and it looks good, and it gets, you know, a younger group of voters. It's when they do things like, say, they're no longer taking corporate money or they're no longer taking pharmaceutical money that I think that's where we're really attacking the root. And that has happened in the Senate with the Democrats, uh, with some of them. But I I think we're winning the moral argument right now. As, as Alex Ocasio-Cortez just said, I think we're many, winning the issues arguments right now, e- even across the board with Republicans, too, across demographics. When you talk about economics and, 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 and income inequality, it affects you know, pretty much everybody in this country. The electoral, I think why this was so transformative is because you could not identify two more difficult places to run for office than the Bronx and Queens in terms of the machine. And Alex Ocasio-Cortez annihilated somebody who was being chosen to be the next speaker, most likely, right. because not just because he raised money, not because he was like some sort of likable guy, because he was very good at controlling people, but he couldn't even control his own machine. Right. That's interesting. I mean, this is a guy who had real skills. This is not an oh, yeah. unskilled politician. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, and how much do you think he was aware that this was happening? I mean, he, it, it wasn't like the David Bratt, uh, right. Eric Cantor thing, where I think like Eric Cantor showed up in his uh, district three weeks before the election and was like, hey, wait a second, what's going on here? I feel like Crowley has been aware of this as a problem for at least like three or four months, at least. I think, that, yes and no. I mean, I think that they were worried about her breaking past maybe like 30% and embarrassing him as he went into the, the speaker or the, right. you know, whatever race he's, depending on what happens in the house, right? Um, but let's not forget, and I, I, I tweeted about this yesterday, about how journalists go to elected officials for electoral advice or strategy. And a lot of these elected officials, Cuomo, Crowley, not everybody, um, they, they walked into their seats Schumer's different, actually. Schumer hustled his way in. Right. He he fought. He and he, you can see it sometimes. It comes out. He has a sense of where the wind is blowing. I don't agree with a lot of his policies and who backs him, but he does have a sense of where the wind is blowing on the ground. Crowley inherited that seat. He was a staffer for the previous congressman. And the way that New York politics works is most seven out of ten, I think, elected officials end up inheriting their seats by county committee. Because the county committee basically decides who the Democratic nominee is going to be when there's a special election. And there right. are a lot of special elections in New York for corruption, for retirement, a whole bunch of reasons. And that's what, you know, he inherited the seat. He's never had a real, real opposition. He basically lives in Virginia. As Alex Ocasio-Cortez says, he doesn't drink the water. His kids don't go to our schools. So there's a disconnect. And, you know, I, that meeting I went to with that lawmaker the other day, um, and he's a good guy. I'm, I, he's actually very progressive, so I shouldn't, you know, he's not like all other politicians. He asked me my perspective after we kind of broke, broke down the numbers. He said, it's like when a farmer, when a farmer is on a farm and they feel that that day, the previous year, it was two degrees cooler. 
Real sophisticated politicians know when things are moving just by the slightest degree. And those are mm. people who are connected to the roots. Those are people who know what their voters are like. Those are people who go around in their neighborhoods and talk to the business owners. Those are people who are listening. And that's what Alex was paying attention to. Joe Crowley had no clue what the temperature was like in his district at all. Last year, the year before, the last 15 years. I, I mean, I sort of feel that's a, um, a perfect metaphor for someone like Nancy Pelosi with, yes. the, with, the, entire, um, with the entire caucus. And, 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 and not just the entire caucus, the entire party. Because in the main, I am supportive of Nancy Pelosi. I think, you know, in her capacity as a uh, uh, both a majority and a minority leader, you know, she never took a vote that she didn't win. I mean, she she knew what was going on with that caucus. But I think her sense of what's going on in national politics now, I think it is there's some there we've gone past some type of tipping point where she seems completely adrift. I think Chuck Schumer also completely adrift and no sense of not just even um, and, and I'm just talking from just sheer. Uh, political assessment and, and what like the idea that they would come out with Pago mm. a couple of weeks ago is just bizarre to me. Yeah. The idea that Chuck Schumer is talking about, uh, you know, gas prices or, or you know, or, or afraid to get involved in the mix where we are kidnapping yeah. children at the border is insane. Like Jeff Merkley, when he went down there, it felt like he was going rogue. Right. And because he was he so, was going rogue. He, I mean, he was. <laughs> and that is stunning yeah. that there are just opportunity after opportunity after opportunity in terms of politics. And they seem completely out of touch. And I don't know if it's just a function of of you're in the leadership for too long. If you're in the leadership for too long and uh, you're also like pushing uh, your uh, your late 70s, early 80s with a lot of these folks and uh, add in. The 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 rate of change on the ground, Mm -hmm. all those things combined make it feel like they are they've been jettisoned Mm -hmm. into the ether and have no sense of what's going on. I mean, one of the things that I'm very encouraged about is and Crowley, I think, sort of ironically, was probably the most in touch of the leadership of the Democratic Party. But he still was like part of that generation on some level. And that opening there creates an opening for people who are a little bit more i i just feel like you sometimes you need to to break that up like uh and and, and i think that's pretty positive all right so let's i want to also talk to you about y- your what you've been doing on this commission because mm-hmm. there's a couple of things i mean first tell us about the the um well let's start with this i know you've pushed caucuses in the past is that right or no no that was a smear campaign that the oh my goodness that's how mar- far pure, permeated Oh, this drove me crazy. So during the the, the Reform Commission, uh, there was a, a very coordinated effort, funded effort, to smear members in the commission who are outspoken about reforms. And they, people like Joy Reid and Neera Tandon uh, just said these things openly. I mean, I made complaints to MSNBC that none of us were actually, it wasn't one or the other. There were four areas of reform. We don't have the ability to eliminate primaries and put caucuses in. It was about reforming caucuses right, this is and all reforming states. primaries. This is all that states do. Right, right, right. It, and, and it was infuriating because we just kept having to set the record straight and they just kept smearing. Well, what is the, I mean, is there, is there anybody out there who's pushing caucuses over primaries? No, absolutely right. not. Okay. All right, good. Because I, I was, I mean, and, and I guess I was, I mean, I fell victim to that. And, and, and there, uh, that this notion of like, and it wasn't, I mean, a huge deal. It just didn't make sense to me. Like, why would you push a caucus? It's not necessarily any more. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to achieve any of the aims that anybody associated with it wants. It's not, it's less democratic. I mean, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with them. Although, you know, maybe it's like a secondary thing, but it's less democratic. Uh, and it's not necessarily open to, it's almost runs contrary to the idea of like, more open primaries, but yeah. we'll, we'll go to that. Let me let me give you the, the alternative, because the, the irony of this was that I was being attacked for having some sort of weird caucus agenda over primaries when I actually had your perspective going in. And I was enlightened because, you know, we had these experts, you know, people who'd worked in caucus states, people, uh, we, we looked at literally every, there were four areas that we were concerned with. Party reform, which is a big bucket, they called it. And I was on the party reform committee. Primary reform, I was involved in that because I'm from New York and it has the worst primary. Um, caucus reform and superdelegate reform. 
And so we had experts in all these areas as we traveled around the country and we debated. I mean, this was a commission, the majority of the commission was Hillary supporter of Hillary appointees. What I learned was actually fascinating regarding caucuses. You look at the country right now and most of the state legislatures are Republican controlled. And of those state legislatures, or in our state, <laughs> yeah, Republican controlled right, right. in New York. Uh, so, th- so the primary rules, the primary process is overseen by Republicans. Under caucuses, the majority of caucuses are in more conservative states, some exceptions. And they need reform. All of them need reforms. But those caucuses are overseen by the Democratic Party. It's a way for the Democratic Party to, to kind of protect their process away from voter suppression. And there were countless examples that were used. We, we had legal experts come in, and it, it blew my mind. So I, I see the argument for why caucuses are important in some states. It wouldn't work in a state like New York. It wouldn't work right. in others, you know, Florida. But That's interesting. And so uh, if it's a Republican-controlled state, uh, things like the dates of primaries, like uh, how, like uh, are we going to do state and voter federal ID at the same laws. time? laws. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, whereas caucuses, you don't, you don't impose voter ID laws or... I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, I think there's definitely an argument for them as a, as a secondary tool on some level, right? And or I, think, like a- I think the arguments that people make against caucuses were all addressed in the Reform Commission. Accessibility, you know, uh, are, are you disabled? Um, you know, how long should you be there all day? We recommended a set of reforms that were, I think, profound. Make, uh, the, and, and where are those reforms in the pro- like, mm-hmm. like, have they? Do, does that committee even have the ability to implement these things, or just suggestions to state to state parties? There, well, it's a little complicated. So, the DNC Reform Commission. Um, we've had several commissions in the past. In fact, super delegates were invented at the Hunt Commission in 1981, and now they're soon going to be gone. Thank goodness. But th- th- these commissions actually do a lot for the rules of the party. And it's been behind closed doors in the past, but there's been a lot of attention. So the report was issued before the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Okay, So think like Congress. This is how it works. Right. It goes from committee to committee and then goes for a final vote. So the Rules and Bylaws Committee had met for the last few months, and, and actually they're doing their final vote uh, on one other thing in a few weeks. But they voted on the superdelegates issue just a few days ago, two days ago. Then it goes, the whole entire set of recommendations go b- before the larger DNC at the end of August in Chicago. And that's actually good. We were worried about the Rules and Bylaws Committee because they're all appointed and none of the Bernie people were on the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Right, okay. Not one person. So we actually did fairly well there and they wanted to take some of our recommendations further. Because don't forget, our commission was compromised. Nina Turner and I, we both voted to eliminate superdelegates and we abstained, I should say, from the vote because we didn't believe it went far enough. And the RBC, the Rules and Bylaws Committee, actually took it further. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And so, all right, so tell us, what yeah. is happening with superdelegates? I mean, I, I have to tell you that for me, um, outside of, like, I'm not convinced. The, the biggest problem with superdelegates, from my perspective, has always been that it um, creates a sense of momentum in the in the media narrative mm-hmm. that isn't necessarily there. Um, Correct. And I think that the impact of that can be overstated. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think like you know, yeah, I mean, AOC's victory against Crowley on some level is an example of like the media narrative doesn't always dictate. But the media never paid attention to that race at all. That's true. Uh, yeah, That's true. For our lefty friends like the Intercept. That's true. Job. That's true. Um, but but with that said, um, I think there there is – well, tell me what the reform is. Because the only value I saw out of the superdelegates was like, um, let's say you have a candidate who gets indicted uh, mm-hmm. from June to – I mean, it, it shouldn't happen that way. I mean, specifically, yeah. that is – but, but I mean, clearly, sometimes, it, 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 yeah. you know, who knows? You can't count on uh, – well, you get a candidate who's indicted yeah. uh, or, you know, there's some evidence that comes out there like, oh, my God, there's video of them killing somebody. Right. We need to right. we need to stop this or before worse, the election lunch with Donald Trump or having lunch with Donald Trump <laughs> or whatever it is. I mean, yeah. so I think there's some I don't know what but that mechanism emails. is. Right. Well, yes, exactly. But the that was an ironic joke there because uh, actually was an issue. But <laughs> but but but. but, but, but well, so what is the reform and mm-hmm. is there still a mechanism to, like, hit the emergency break. Yeah. Well, there's always been a mechanism to hit the emergency break, break outside of superdelegates. The chair 
I don't think this is the right mechanism, but the chair of the party actually has authority to like pick another candidate if they yeah, want to. That's terrifying. That's crazy. To me. Right. Especially. Right. Anyways, I'm going to cut that off before the vote for the DNC. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, so, so, so superdelegates, the, the funny thing about this is that the intention of superdelegates in 1981 to, were to be just that, that they weren't supposed to declare who they were supporting until they were on the convention floor in this sort of emergency situation. I remember right. being on CBS News in 2016. Uh, I think it was maybe a few, two months before the California primary, so whatever that was, May. Uh, April, May. And they had at that point basically declared, even though it was right after New York, so they had declared the race for Hillary. And everybody was talking about superdelegates. I said, you're, you're counting the superdelegates in the delegates, but the superdelegates don't count until the convention. Right. They're you, not committed yet. They're not they can committed. change their mind. They do all the, I mean, they've done in the past. They've done all the past, but you can't, but it's not, it's technically against the rules. Right. It was already against the rules. And I got into such a debate about this, even with a political reporter there, that I had to pull up the rules of the Democratic Party and show it to them on air because there was such a false narrative. And was that the last time that you went on air? No, I'm actually a contributor there oh, still. Oh, well, there you and go. P.S. He's fired now for a Me Too scandal. I feel like I can say that out loud. There you go. Hold on. Let's Karma. do this. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> they haven't had me on, though, in a while, so. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, but now the rule is this, that... Super okay, yes, there's still super delegates. And I, I see people on Twitter saying, Well, there's still super delegates. You have an limit. There's still super delegates, but they cannot vote on the first ballot. It's when it gets to the second ballot ballot that they will have the ability to vote. I mean what else are you gonna do when there's a stalemate? So basically <laughs> okay, so so they um they only come in uh, if it is undecided, essentially, mm-hmm. by the de- delegates who are actually decided by the people who voted right. for them. And it's not all superdelegates. The, the reduction is basically, it's basically the electeds that are left, the, the congressional members. Those, all right, well, those are the second ones or the first? Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, yeah, it's confusing. I know. Okay, no, no, no. But I mean, I understand. So yeah. there are two types of superdelegates generally. There are um, sort of like dignitaries from the Democratic Party, right. and then there are some who are like sitting politicians. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, the sitting politicians get to vote in the first round. Is that no, it, or no? Nobody gets to vote. In the first nobody round. first gets to vote. Oh, in, in the second round, it's only basically. Yeah. So the dignitaries are just now they get to like w- they have a key. They yeah. get they get a key. They get we're going to give you a badge and a medal, and you're a super delegate. Yeah. Wink, wink. Keep donating money. Yeah. Uh, and, type and, of situation. and there's been these like crazy responses that are just not they're they're not based on any sort of reality. There was. There were some racial elements that are brought, brought up saying it protects um, the African American vote. There's just no evidence of that at all. It's it's actually the reversal. I mean, that's the super delegates protect the African American yeah. vote. I don't really. I, I've I actually haven't even heard the defense of that. I've heard the argument. I haven't heard the facts. Or, you know, and I I was on this commission and I just kept hearing it over and over. And I said, okay, so show me the proof because super delegate. I understand why they were. In, it was at a time when. There wasn't a black caucus in Congress. Right. right. And so I, I get that side of it. But a, one superdelegate equals 10,000 votes. So if you're reflecting the will of the voter and you're a member of the CBC, then you're actually protecting your people by actually voting with your district. Right. So it, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, it's going to go before the DNC still for for a larger vote. I I, I think it would be crazy at this point for the dnc to vote against the rbc it would just be a bad media situation it seems unlikely to me yeah. i mean um i you know I, at the dnc this past time i was i was talking to uh is it christine pelosi yeah yeah and and the first thing she talked about was like we really do got to uh do this yeah. super delegate uh we've got to reform the super delegate i mean so it seems to be like wide understanding broad understanding of it because it causes frankly more problems than it solves the big problem that it should solve is that it is a, you know, uh, a, an emergency break. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, it's they don't, you know, it's really they're just their power lies in the media narrative of people being, you know, sloppy about it. People and like they like to have power. Of course. Of course. And not every congressman. There were a lot of congressmen who've stepped forward. They've signed our letter in support of, of the reforms. But some it's just you, you they love it. That's. I mean, they say it. They openly say it. They're like, we earned this. 
No, you walked into the rational seat, seat. You know, Joe Crowley. <laughs> what, what did you earn? Exactly. All right. Well, let me ask you. I mean, I want to broaden out just for the, the past week. And, and I appreciate that insight into that process mm-hmm. because I think it is um, so much like toxic crap came out of the of the the whole process with the DNC that that spun out in multiple directions, it seems to me, that I think incredibly unhelpful, particularly at this time. Can I make one more point about that I'm yeah. sorry, before, before we move on? I also think that while superdelegates are tremendously important, they're not the root problem with the Democratic Party right now. And they've almost become a distraction, whether intentionally or not, I think both, um, away from the issues like where's the money going, our state's party parties being supported. How are we going to win back these races? And also, like, there's a privatization effort. Like, there's there's outside organizations who are doing the work of the DNC right now and with no oversight. Well, let, uh, let's ask. Uh, let me ask you about that since you have uh, insight into it. Because what we're talking about is really, on one level, first order problem is distinct from politics and ideology. Mm-hmm. It is really just yes. um, a systemic. It's just that you have an institution that has become sclerotic and corrupted in many respects and uh, because no one's really been paying attention to it in some way. Like, Mm -hmm. people are making money. No one's going to lift up the lid and look in there and see what's going on. Um, And that is completely distinct Mm -hmm. from an ideological – I mean, there may be some – some things may track it. Like, you know, if you have people who really think that money is the ascendant value and I get into a a system, that's what I'm going to pull out of it. But but in terms of the way that I think most people understand politics as, you know, a function of – of, um, you know, issue sets and this and that. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're there for. They're there because they're enriching themselves. It's a lot like, almost like in some ways, local politics. Mm -hmm. Um, How wide is the understanding of that? What is going to deal with it? Because, you know, there's, there's multiple forces where you have, like, the Obama people really wanted to maintain control, it Mm -hmm. seems to me, of... Not so much the machine. Like, I, I didn't get the sense that the Obama people wanted because they, they were making the money from it as much as, like, we don't want the party to move in a direction that we sort of think is politically wrong. But they were willing to maintain an apparatus that mm-hmm. is inherently dysfunctional. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. like, you know, I mean, it, it's just by definition of it's losing races yeah. across the country in in in, in races that in, in an environment where it shouldn't have. I mean, mm-hmm. 2008. We should have been able to get rid of like there shouldn't have, people would have to look in the history books to see what a Republican Party is. I mean, yeah. theoretically, if 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 we had been a, if, if the party this. apparatus had been functioning the way it should yeah. have been. So how do you dislodge that? Because it's really basically what you're trying to do is keep people from making money the only way they know how. Mm. And people tend to like. Mm hmm. In my experience, hold on to that very tightly. Yeah, especially if their identities are attached to it. And Of course. And no one's ever looked into... You know. so I this mean, is, this is a problem that people have, like, in businesses, yeah. too. Like, how do we get rid of this culture in this business? Yeah. So this was this was my pet pet issue. Um, maybe some of your listeners and viewers uh, saw the video that went viral, the last yes. commission, where I basically had a meltdown and I dropped an F-bomb on the floor. Well, the backstory on that was, first thing, it was... After eight months of debating this, we just come out of a room where we had an agreement on one of my um, one of my resolutions. Then we went on onto the floor, and everybody, all the other side, they started questioning it. And so, right before me, uh, Gus Newport, one of our our appointees, he said something very powerful, and he said it was ridiculous. And then I, and it was my resolution, so I just you know flipped the heck out. But I think you have you have a couple issues here at play. Human nature. People want to keep their money, and this is what they've attached themselves to. And there's a lot of people who failed up, literally failed up in democratic politics. In fact, I'd say the majority of consultants out there are just failing up um, and giving really bad advice. So if you plan on running for office, you know, half most of them are full of shit. And, just, and, <laughs> and let me just say this, I mean, just so that uh, yeah. people understand sort of what intersects with this with this uh, with this conversation. Um, I interviewed uh, uh, Ryan Grimm about his piece in The Intercept, which talked about DNC uh, and DCCC Mm -hmm. representatives coming into campaigns, uh, often choosing the wrong people, 
um, and uh, sort of bigfooting the local people in many respects. There was another report by uh, Theta Scotchbull and uh, Lena Putnam mm-hmm. that showed the same dynamic, not with the ideological differences. I mean, you're talking about people who might be, you know, sort of, um, you know, just sort of mainstream Democrats, yeah. uh, but also feeling the same way of like, hey, wait a second. You know, the, the people are coming in and they're they're bigfooting us. And they're not listening to people on the ground who have a sense of what's going on in the district. And so it's the, you have these stories of a dysfunctional system within the party that I think is less ideological and more sort of like um, systematized. Right. Or there's some there's got to be some business management term for what the problem is. So I think it's intentional. I'm just I'm at this point in the game. And, and I think if I had said this two months ago, I'd been called a conspiracy theorist. I think at this point in the game, it's so clear that this model doesn't no, the model doesn't work. But then it's so clear that some of these people and these ideas after being called out so openly, they're being exposed and they're still doing it. There is some other thing happening. I'm going to rewind a little bit. In the late 70s, uh, the Democratic Party purged. Union. They literally made a decision with the yes. DLC. The DLC. I'm, I'm not. I'm not fucking around here when I say this. I can say fuck, right? Yeah, but not okay. the DLC. Not the Democratic Leadership Council. The DLC. This is important. The DLC. One of their earliest investors is in the 80s, though. Was right. the Koch brothers? But it was yes. all around that time. But this is 1980. 1980. Right now, Wait, in the early 70s. 70s Late the, 70s, I'm uh, in the early 70s, unions were pushed to the sideline yes. by the McGovern Commission. In right. fact, that's where the yes. whole superdelegates yes. reform came from, because they didn't want it the back room and they didn't right. want just the union heads to be. And, and there was yes. uh, an, an attempt to move towards the suburbs. And, uh, and we've done a couple of, uh, of interviews on that over the yeah. past couple of years. But 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 yes, but, but in the 80s this movement, right? There so, was an idea of like, we need more corporate money. Exactly. So you had the, the purging, the actual DNC members being purged, the union members being purged and replaced with corporate members. Uh, I think it was, I don't think they legalized lobbyists that I think that was later, but Tony Co- Coelho. Co- I, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So go ahead. But love that guy. Um, so this was all happening. And at the same time, the centralization of the DNC happened. So what does that mean? It means that the DNC is no longer putting all of its money into state parties. And, you know, the, the, it was the death of, of the, the clubs. I mean, th- there were clubs everywhere, precinct captains. All, it was an investment in, in, in neighborhood Democratic po- politics, which really was hand-in-hand hand with unions. If you think right. about unions, I had a friend of mine say this the other day. He's a consultant. And he was trying to find somebody for somebody's campaign. I'm not going to say who. Um, and he is a very good consultant. Like there's not many, but he was, he's kind of like the guy that you call for, for help in the end. And he said, we just have, there's just, there's no infrastructure. There's no infrastructure. He goes, there's no talent. There's no talent being groomed. And he said, it used to be that the unions worked with the Democrats on this. And when you kill unions, when you kick them out of your party, when the Koch brothers are going after them state by state, now, I mean, the Janus ruling, right. whatever's left to them, you know, these were the organizers. Right. They were, these were the precinct captains. And at the same time, the Democratic Party decides they're only going to focus on presidential politics, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. The only time we kind of went back was in 2006 when we won the House. And we should say the... The, these decisions were made at a time where the Democratic Party had controlled the, the exactly. House, uh, the, uh, the the House for forty years. Yes, there was never a time, you know. And these guys, I don't know if you you appreciate this. There was never a time where the Democrats did not control uh, Congress uh, for in the entire post-war yep. period. And so they felt like we don't need to do anything right. about it. We don't need this infrastructure. We got to play this game of like 30,000 feet. We'll deal only with the president because we'll never have to worry about Congress. And of course, in the mid nineties, then that falls apart. Is insane. So unions are being Certainly attacked. Certainly in retrospect. I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know at that time if, if some type of redeploying of your, you know, I can understand why someone might get cocky over 40 years like, eh, we got this. And I mean, listen, but Governor Cuomo has accepted more money from the Koch brothers than Scott Walker did. Right. At some point, we just have to sit there and say to ourselves, is is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog, I mean like this is this is it's not that the Koch brothers invested in state parties because the Democrats were no longer investing which is the message I kept hearing 
I'm hearing, why the hell did the Democrats stop investing in their state parties and weaken the party? It's, it's basically disaster capitalism for the Democratic Party. And then as a result, they have these, all, these private entities where they bring the billionaires in and the democracy alliance and, and, and there's no oversight. Right. And suddenly the billionaires know better about electoral politics and, you know, the new, the new Eric Holder Obama group to protect, to, to, to protect legislatures. Where the hell were you over the last eight years? You essentially didn't pay attention to the DNC and the DLCC Whose job that is? Right. Let me let me tease out what you mean by this Sorry. disaster <laughs> capitalism. No, I mean I think this is a really interesting point. Uh, the idea being that once you deplete the infrastructure, the sort of the the disaggregated I- infrastructure that is, uh, um, I don't want to get overly dramatic, but more democratic uh, and dispersed, and and it's hierarchical mm-hmm. uh, because it's a system, right. but it is staffed it, it comes from communities yes. up and it populates it up that way as a and once that's gone then you come in and say like oh well we need an infrastructure the only way to get that is to buy it mm-hmm. and we're going to buy it with a huge amount of money we're going to you know come from outside of town and we're going to build it from like that which is exactly you know the model of disaster capitalism um and all of a sudden now the authority shifts from uh, the local people and the infrastructure to the big money uh, people who have just parachuted in. And they're also, not only is it bad in terms of who has control, but it also is repeatedly less effective. Yeah. Uh, And we've seen that. And we've seen that dramatically. And simultaneously, on the right, we've seen the growth in particular of, and I think this is why it's, you know, uh, of mega churches and of religious institutions that have filled this void. And then a huge amount of money that comes in from the Koch brothers. And the way they spend money mm-hmm. is um, pretty adept. Like they spread it around like, you know, we're going to a thousand uh, flowers are going to bloom. And, and they're strategic. They're very strategic about where they're investing, who they're investing in, who they're... I mean, listen, Scott Walker, they... they Groomed him from, exactly. like, when he was, uh, like, county, I don't know, yeah. a dog catcher or something. Exactly. Yeah. It's... It, it's and they're, and, and they, they wage wars in, in areas that they know they can, they can win. We don't do that as Democrats. I, I will say there was this brief period, obviously, it was over a decade ago, but in 2006, when we won back the House, there's no coincidence that, and granted, there was an anti-war movement and a lot of stuff was happening. And Corruption George, was the big, corruption, anti-corruption was yes. the big thing. Uh, but we also invested in every state the, under Howard Dean's Howard DNC. Dean, yes. And there's this, there's this book, um, oh gosh, what is it called? It's Lindsay Marks. He was the former finance director of the DNC during that time. And he talks about the inner fundraising, like the rise of fundraising in the Democratic Party. And it's fascinating because at the end of the book, there's this moment where he's discussing Senator Schumer, Rahm Emanuel, and uh, Howard Dean sitting in the room talking about this program to invest in states. And Rahm Emanuel at that time, who was a congressman at the time, was also the head of the DCCC. And he was fighting with Dean about the 50-state strategy because he goes, why, why, why invest in states when we're not, not competitive states? Why should we invest there? And to me, that, that's the essence of, this, of their argument is like, why should we spend our money everywhere when we could just spend it in a couple of places? But that's based on an assumption of the DCCC understanding what that district is going through. And what we're seeing is, is places like John Ossoff. What? Right. For how many million? Forty million dollars. What was yeah, that? Right. Forty million dollars on that race for somebody who like basically didn't grow, wasn't even from there, had no, you know, was a staffer. Not, not nothing wrong with being a staffer, but like milk toast, boring. Well, right. I mean, it, John Offs of uh, uh, wins. It's not really going to change the tide of anything. It's not like we're going to install like it's it's Tip O'Neill. Yeah. And he's just been out of office yeah. for two years. We got to get him back in. Right. It's not the, like even winning doesn't seem like the, the return on investment, even if he wins, doesn't seem that high. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a real um, it's it's a it's a real problem. And I and I wonder um, I mean, I think. I mean, give me your sense of, of, I mean, I guess it is to break that log jam. Mm. I mean, is there another way to, to go around it? Is it, is, 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 you know, something like the DSA on some level 
seems to be. I mean, it doesn't have the nearly the resources, you know, to, to compete. Uh, but I it has. A, I should I should restate that in places where it's strong, it clearly has resources right. that aren't necessarily dollar based. Right. right? The services in kind because uh, you Very have motivated so. people. Um, but that's not an answer for 2018 uh, for every or even election, 2020. Right. I mean, it, it's. Um, what what is the answer? Is there an answer? And well, we do have to reform the DNC. And while the DNC is not the DCCC or the DSCC, it 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 helps that if if we actually flip the model the way that we've been pushing, and I do think that there's an appetite for that in the DNC membership. And I want to make that a lot of people. There's are like, like 470 yeah. members of the DNC. Yeah. Is that what it is? Four, I think so. Well, let's just call it 450 for yeah. the sake of argument. How like aware are these people? Because most of the people I meet who are members of the DNC are not like they're not, uh, you know, Darth Vader. Like right. I, mean, I think there may be a couple of Darth Vaders oh, in Washington. Oh, there are. But, there are definitely some Darth Vaders in the DNC, but there are also a lot of good people. Good people who understand their districts. They r- ran for DNC. They are involved. They're Involve, not as many union people anymore, but I would say this: this is the way I break it down when I when I try to explain to people where the DNC stands. It's not like this entity that this megalith that like they all think the same way. It's not that's not how it functions. It's a diverse group from all fifty states and uh, the territories and uh, abroad, Democrats abroad, and they. I would say there's thirty five percent of the DNC have conflicts of interests. They're lobbyists. They literally make money off the DNC. They've worked at the DNC. They're in and out. Um, that to me is like the like the typical like I live in a small town. I'm going to join the United Way, and uh, the United Net Way needs uh, to print some flyers. I happen to own a printing company. That's exactly. I mean, it's basically that type of dynamic, right? Except except the guy who's printing the flyers wouldn't be on the board of the United Way, or. It's pretty sad when Goldman right. Sachs has more board oversight than the Democratic Party does over its executive committee. Right. And 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 what's the way to reform that? Is it simply to reach those 450 people and say, you got to vote for somebody different? Uh, no. I, well, yes. <laughs> but also the recommendations that we have actually address a lot of these reforms. So this was Dr. Jim Zogby and I were on the reform, uh, the party reform committee, and we pushed for transparency, budget transparency. And when I mean budget transparency, I don't mean a pie chart that they, that's what they use. Right. They use a pie chart. And they're like, oh, our budget's transparent. We spent all this money here. They don't say how much money's come in, where they're spending it, who are the consultants, how do, are there bid contracts. So there's just no proper o- oversight. There's no oversight. It's and, a joke. And if the 450 members of the DNC had the proper oversight, that they would, they would, they would be fixing this. And they want it. I think that the majority of them want it. What we saw with the DNC chairs race, it was very close. Don't forget that first ballot. Right. Tom Perez won it by a half. Or, oh, I'm sorry. One and a half because Democrats abroad is a half. One and a half votes. And then it moved to the second ballot. And, you know, some shenanigans happened behind the right. scenes beyond the president calling people on the floor. There was some other stuff that happened. But that was when, I mean, that, the party was split then. I think that we probably have more people on our side, especially after a win like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I think a lot of people are starting to see that the current model is not working, but these are like the insiders. They're still insiders. Right. So they're still, even though they might be moved by the people and have personal opinions about things, some of these folks are worried about making the chair upset. They, there's still that institutional establishment right. mindset, and that's what we have to overcome. All right. Well, look, um, we got to take a... Uh well, I know we don't have to take a break. Let's just go and start doing some uh, audio. We don't have a. Um, we got some some more clips here. That 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 stuff. I, I I think it may be dry for some folks. I I think it's uh, hugely important uh, because you're never your outputs. Um, you know, there, there's two things that function your outputs. That is your inputs, mm-hmm. and which I think people are working on. Uh, and is, 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 you know, much better. We're seeing, you know, a lot of candidates. We're seeing people come out and vote in, um, you know, uh, mid-year uh, primaries like they never have before. Um, but if your, uh, your function, your, that black box, yeah. 
is messed up, then the outputs get screwed up. And it's, there's a lot of, we, we can't afford to waste energy or resources right now because right. uh, it's such a crap show. And donors deserve it too. I mean, billionaire donors are one thing, but people who are giving to the Democratic Party deserve to have their money used. I mean, they're investing in the party because they want Democrats to win. And whether it's Emily's List or the DCCC or HRC, all of these groups have a responsibility to the, to the, the, the small dollar donors just as much as the big donors. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, I want my $27 back. <laughs> Bernie? For, I think he get, that was a good return on investment, no? Yeah, okay. <laughs> DSA now has a, a surge, right? Yes, it's uh, been pretty big for us, so... I'm not effect. going to tear my nose up at it. <laughs> well, l- along those lines, let's listen to uh, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez on uh, Colbert talking about how, I mean, in many respects, look, I think voters are a lot more um, engaged, at least Democratic voters um, are a lot more engaged than they have been at this part of a cycle you know, as far as I can remember, frankly. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, even in 2006, much of it was literally about a, uh, a scandal with a a Republican congressman who was like a predator on pages and was being covered up by the uh, Republican leadership. Uh, but that was not the case in this election with Joe Crowley. And uh, here's uh, um, Ocasio-Cortez explaining how she had a sense that um, there was something going on with the electorate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, obviously, uh, you, you're a very capable, intelligent person. Why do you think you were able to swing 51 points in three weeks and unseat yeah. this man and been there for 20 years? Well, I think the first thing to kind of mention is that I don't think polling is always right. <laughs> we learned that so. in 2016. We learned that in 2016. You know, yes. polling, here's the big thing. Polling, people try to identify who is the most likely person to turn out. And what we did is that we changed who turns out. And that changes the whole election. Well, who turned out? Who doesn't turn out? Who doesn't turn out, especially for Democratic primaries? And who turned out for you? What, what, is, what is your, who are your constituents? Well, I'll tell you one thing. We were about eight minutes till the polls were closing. And I was in my home neighborhood in the Bronx. And these two young, oh yeah, BX, we got any BX out here? <laughs> um, and it was eight minutes till the polls closed, and these two, like, teenage looking kids came up to me. He was like, We just voted for you. And I was like, How old are you? And they're like, 19. And I was like, Oh, 19 years old voting in an off year midterm primary election? <laughs> She's, I mean, I, I was watching uh, footage of her, you know, before the show today, and if she was, I mean, speaking of young, right, I mean, she's 28, um, Matt, right, she's just about your age. I'm 29. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but if she was three or four years older, um, I would not be shocked to have her picked as the vice presidential nominee in 2020. I mean, I mean, I would she, right now she's so no, literally not eligible yeah. to do that. She will not be old enough. Oh my gosh, you're right. She will not be old enough to do it. But um, the idea at age 28 that she has this poise, this savvy and, um, and presence, um, I think is, is nuts. I mean, this was an indi- this was a f- this was multiple things coming together, which was good politics. Right. Like she had a good issue set. Demographically, she reflected her district in a way that Crowley was no longer doing. That's true, but that's not why she won. There's a lot of misinformation being set out about that. Which we, I'll, I'll explain we'll why that's a thing. Yeah, and three, yeah. she's a great retail politician. Hundred percent. Right. I mean. But but tell me demographically that yeah. that she's I mean she's not uh, give me your take on well okay so I live in Queens and and I was I'm friends with her so it was just full discretion I knew I, it was discretion full discretion disclosure full discretion here talk about not sleeping for three days um, 
so she's from she's from the Bronx, and the Bronx, for those of you who don't know, is uh, is the Bronx and Queens are the most diverse places in the entire world. Yes, number one and number two in the and used to be Queens was now it's the Bronx, and they've switched positions. Uh, they also have this these machines, as I've mentioned, that are very very invested in keeping the vote down. So keep that in mind. In fact. I don't know if specifically these districts, but the pre-clearance, um, uh, the pre-clearance counties before the Supreme Court gutted uh, our pre-clearance in the, the Voting Rights Act included right. at least some districts from Queens and Bronx, right. which people don't know. They just assume it's all southern uh, states. But Queens and Bronx were, were places where there was a, uh, enough of a history of racial discrimination in access to the vote that they had to go through a pre-clearance process with the doj before the supreme court uh, blew it up uh and now it's just with our voting laws it's with our voting laws and and the machine the machines of these counties in the bronx in particular um it's very complicated and i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but it's there's there's an interest in keeping some people who are making a lot of money off of kind of not representing their own people and not necessarily in office, but people who are running the, the, the machine there, um, consultants. So Alex, while she's Latina and while she speaks Spanish and while she's Puerto Rican and she understands and she's from the district and she really gets it, the changing demographics in, in the Bronx too, but in areas like uh, Astoria where I live uh, and, uh, you know, other uh, gentrification is not the right word for th- these parts because they they were white, but it's like a new white <laughs> Right. A different working class white, because that's what Crowley, why he was elected, was he had the Irish, the right. white voters of that generation. But these are all Bernie voters. And the Bernie voters organized, and they turned out. And that's what happened in that district. If she didn't win that demo, she wouldn't have won. And so what, when I say the, the... The the creative class, almost like the cousin to the creative class, is I, that what you're saying? I, mean, I like, guess. I don't... I mean, because it's not like right. they're wealthy. They're not... Right. I mean, I'm not like... I'm, I get... I'm unemployed right now, so... <laughs> but it's not... But it's not... But, but I think the yeah. creative class was not necessarily about money as much as it was about sort of... Yeah. You know, I don't know, the philosophy. new economy or yeah. philosophy or something like that, I guess. Yeah, and and, and a lot of them are DSA members. There's a very strong, I was at the Queen's DSA meeting last night, and, you know, there are a lot of new members that were there. Um, but aside from that, the reason why I mention this is because uh, both Nancy Pelosi and Governor Cuomo were like, you know, what happened in that district is it's an anomaly, and it's because she's a Latina, and she got the Latino vote. That's not why, first thing, that's not why she won. She did obviously get the latino vote but it was because she got this other vote and she was talking about intersectional issues right. it is fantastic that she's a person of color a woman a millennial a socialist a working class person i went to this restaurant called the coffee shop the other day which is in union square and i just happened to have a meeting there and this guy heard us talking about politics and he goes you know alex used to be a bartender here just like five months ago or six months ago and it, i mean i got chills because that person is now in Congress representing us. And she didn't get elected because she was a Latina. She got elected because of her ideas. And she was able to use those ideas that transcended the entire district. And that is the model that's going to work. I don't care what Nancy Pelosi says. That is not, it was not because she was a Latina in well, a Latina district. Well, all right. Let me, let me restate what I meant by demographics. She was not an old white guy. Right. I mean, uh, that's... But, but that's old me. white guys work too. Bernie won in that district. In- that's, that's true. Fair enough. Sorry, I don't mean to yeah. like... No, no, I mean... The people who voted for Bernie are such a good list to have when we're working on other campaigns because they're so receptive to it. It's awesome. Yeah. If Very if the much. candidate if the candidate delivers, I mean, if the candidate yeah. delivers on that promise. Yeah. Also, I think she's. You talk about intersectionality. Like she's doing a really good job. Like there's been this sort of false dichotomy advanced, I think, by a lot of centrist liberals and like a few people on the left as well. That, um, you know, you have to choose between class politics and identity politics. And there are people who really believe that um, that's going to hurt the left if we try to do both at once. And I think that's ridiculous. Like, she's made a really good connection between the two. She's been really good at that over and over. And uh, definitely did a better job than Bernie. So good for her. Oh, absolutely. And there's clearly, I mean, there's also clearly a dynamic that's going on electorally that... um, I think the the all things being equal, the um, the median Democratic voter is pulling the lever for women over men. 
I mean, I think just sort of like right now, that is, um, I think it is all other things being equal. I think that that that, that appears to be a, a legit phenomena. Um, I hope so. I mean, in New York, what's fascinating is just a couple of days before this primary, and let's not forget, New York has two different primary dates. It is so confusing. It is so unbelievable that I literally had a week like two weeks ago i was like shit man we we got to get cynthia nixon on before the primary yeah. and i was like wait a second i had a reporter ask me the day of the election what how do you think cynthia is going to do and i was like um it's 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 june and and, and that's by <laughs> that's by design yes that's why new york has two counties that were in the pre-clearance yes. provisions of the national uh, of the uh of, of the uh, voting rights act because it's effed up here but think about this just just a couple of days before the election uh, there was, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but there were a bunch of hit pieces on groups like Our Revolution and these activist groups who haven't been able to deliver. They haven't won the majority of their elections. I'm sorry, let's just look at the DNC for a second and Emily's right. and DCCC. Like, have they won the majority of their elections? But there's right. another standard for the new organization run by Nina Turner, who's an outspoken reformer. Okay, but with that being said, Emily's list did not endorse any of the women that ran except for literally the day before Gretchen or Luba Gretchen Shirley right. in Long Island and all three of those women that ra- that ran one who had literally run against the establishment the DCCC like recruited somebody all three of the our revolution women won big time and they weren't expected to so something's going on first thing I, I always I always think that on the front lines of the revolution there are women and they right. never get the attention. And they never. And if so, they get smeared like Nina Turner gets smeared or, or Susan Sarandon or Rosario Dawson was during the campaign. And so many of our other sisters, they're, they're not the same as, as the, the chosen ones, I guess. So I, I think this is extraordinary. And in a place like New York where, like, you could not run in a more difficult state and they right. won against the establishment, that means a lot. Yeah. Well, on some level, it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, let me just add that the bars and there's i don't know there's a, there's an analogy in terms of like you know what's happened with the uh, the gerrymandering right like if the democrats get above a certain amount yeah. then everything just falls apart for the republicans but that threshold is higher because of the gerrymandering but in this instance there's also the the difficulty involved in voting um, generally favors the incumbent because there is a sort of a baseline disinterest. Right. Uh, in this instance, the depth of support, not just the scope of it, not not how many people, but how deep that support runs, like what an average supporter was willing to do mm. relative to an average supporter in any other year was so much greater that that became an advantage right. for candidates like this. But the Emily's List thing, too, I would just add, is like um, back in the day, uh, Jane Hampshire over Fire Dog Lake, uh, yeah. you know, I'm going way back now, uh, would describe some of these groups as being in the veal pen. That they would, um, that, that, that there are some groups who go in and they just basically go in and, and, and they're there, they fatten themselves up, and it is really more about maintaining access mm-hmm. and power within mm-hmm. Washington uh, so that they lose sight of their original mission. And on right. some levels, I think there is like crit- criticism of Emily's List that I think is legit in that regard. Um, yeah. In a big, big way. I mean, when you're via- when organizations don't support you because you're not viable and viability, the definition of viability is can you raise $250,000 in two months? And by the way, in some cases, these candidates did. And that's when you're like, okay, so it's not even this bullshit excuse of having to raise, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars right away to get your endorsement, early money. Then you actually do, based off of grassroots donations, and you're not supporting this candidate. What's the real stick here? Is it just because, oh, oh, they're talking about economics, that's why. But do you think, do you think that there is a mechanism in which viability can be measured by outside groups in a, in a, in a, in a, in a an effective long-term way or as opposed to like, look, what we're going to do is we're just not going to get involved in primaries. Like, I mean, like, I think it's the worst idea to not get involved in primaries. So how does an outside group that is based in Washington raising their money, how do they assess a a, a race in, let's say, I mean, take for instance, the 19th. Okay. 
where I have spent the better part of the past 10, 15 years. No idea. I had no idea. Look at that field. I had no idea who was the most likely. I mean, I got a sense of like, you know, what politics I liked of, of individual, but I had no sense of, of which one of these people could actually win the district. Now, the, the turnout was like, tw- I don't know, twice or, or than it was the primary with Zephyr Teachout and Will Yandick. Now, you have right. four times the amount of candidates practically, uh, but there's obviously a lot of enthusiasm on the Democratic mm-hmm. side. So maybe you don't have – maybe there was four people in that race who could right. win. Right. But I, I don't have a sense of who could be – who would be the best candidate. If I had to go in there and, and give yeah. money to, I wouldn't know who to pick if I wanted – a win out of that district? I don't think you get involved in every primary. Uh, you know, the, the, in full disclosure, I do work with our revolution. So, but the model of our revolution is, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, an, it's evolving, right? Right. They have a board. All organizations evolve. But they're based off of, they take their recommendations from the local groups. And the local groups, I mean, this is what the Democratic Party should be doing, right? Right. They should be listening to the local chapters. I was actually a little surprised that our revolution endorsed Alex nationally because a lot of the other chapters around the area hadn't. But there was one chapter, which uh, Bronx Progressives, which is an Our Revolution affiliate, which um, stepped up and said, you know, we have to support her. And they took the recommendation from Bronx Progressive because they're in the district. They were involved. They were volunteering. They had the feel of the, you know, what was happening on the ground. But it was a risk because... Our revolution is also challenging Governor Cuomo. And, you know, sometimes you have to sit there and say to yourself, Is it worth expending our political capital on this congressional race against somebody in the leadership? Or do we want to save our our powder for the big fight against Cuomo? And you know what? It worked out. It worked out. (laughs) Right. Doubled down and worked out. Oh, my God. I was was shocked. Yeah. All right. Do we have a uh, Jimmy Reefer cake song? Oh, my God. (laughs) The excitement. Uh, did he write run, Did he write one for Nomi? I, I don't know that he wrote one for Nomi. I don't <gasps> think he knew that uh, Nomi was going to be on. But, no, right. uh, you guys didn't, didn't promote. We me, uh, we better done. get him on that <laughs> for next time. Jimmy Reefcake needs to do a, uh, a Nomi Const um, uh, theme song. Uh, do, did you find it? Did you find it? I, I actually remember now. I did see it earlier. Now Jimmy Reefcake uh, uh, most weeks mm-hmm. writes a song that. Uh, Reflects the week in news um, and also reflects his uh, his desire for uh, marijuana to be decriminalized uh, across the country. And he's actually had a tremendous amount of success. I don't know if it's because of the show, but he's been doing it for about <laughs> six years. And uh, marijuana has become significantly more um, uh, legalized uh, across the country. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> right. And so uh, this week's do you have this week's? Now, oh, he, we should also tell you that he has um, been on a Doors parody kick. <laughs> <laughs> so this week is... Uh, it's called DA Woman. Yes. So oh based God. on... That's uh, LA oh, Woman. my God. Yeah, here we go. Um, DA Woman. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> Come on and tweet it out about an hour ago. Look around, see which way the wind blow. Oh my god. <laughs> she said legalize weed at the federal level. Are you the lucky little lady gonna <laughs> legalize? <laughs> or just another lost bill? I didn't legalize it. <laughs> legalize it. Legalize it. Sunday afternoon. On Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Driving through your suburbs. Safer than booze. <laughs> it's safer than booze. Yeah, telling the truth. It's just safer than booze. Oh, yeah. I see your weed is burning. <laughs> Bongs are filled Halfway with through. fire. <laughs> if they say that reefer is 
bad. <laughs> He's already laughing. You know they are a liar. Driving down your freeways. <laughs> hey, you to totally fucking stone. <laughs> Driver should be totally stoned. <laughs> I say, let him be totally right. stoned. That's, that's brilliant. There we go. Okay. I assume he's DA woman is uh, Kamal Harris, right? I mean, that's. Right, there you go. DA woman by, so by Jimmy Reaper. We need a box set of the Doors covers, I think. Yeah, yeah. We, could, we could put that out. I mean, of course, I'm sure uh, Jimmy's selling it on uh, all the hypocrisy.com. <laughs> Or you can go to get more of that. All right. Once again, definitely an improvement over the original. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, just a reminder, you can support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Every day we give you uh, free content. You can support that by becoming a member. And to say thank you, we give you uh, more content. And if you're one of those people who can't afford to become a member but you want the extra content, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Wait for 10 days uh, while we catch up on our emails, and then uh, we, will, we will hook you up. Uh, also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use your coupon code uh, majority, get 10% off. Uh, we're going to head into the fun half. Uh, before we do, don't forget uh, the Antifada Jamie's co-hosted uh, podcast. Yeah, so we finally dropped this uh, amazing crossover episode with Brett from Revolutionary Left Radio. It was also our anniversary that day, me and Sean, my co-host. How long have partner. you guys been married? We have been married for a year. We've been together for what? eight years. Seriously? Wow. Just a year? Congratulations. Thank you. Very exciting. What do you do on your first? Was that like a silver, a gold, a paper, a... It is a record a podcast anniversary for us, I guess, because that's what we did. And well, there it, it you was go. That's uh, very it romantic. Was, it was it was very romantic. And right. we also talked with Brett about because he's a dad. We talked about how his uh, parenthood has affected his uh, politics and his political mm-hmm. philosophy and kind oh, of brought a tear to my eye. Right. Because isn't one of the underlying themes of Antifada, Sean, trying to convince you to start a family? It is. It is indeed. <laughs> and where are you with that right now? Mm, you know, maybe he needs to bring on a few more prominent leftists and we'll talk. Wow. I don't even know what that, uh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have to diagram that. <laughs> we talked to Doug Henwood and Liza Featherstone about having kids. They've got a kid. And, and what, what is the, uh, what is the general consensus, would you say, on the, on the left in terms of having kids? I mean, we do need to build an army of red diaper babies, so that's like a pro. Um, And also, it kind of lights a fire under your ass, because once you have kids, you're like, oh, shit, the world is fucked. I need to do something about this, which sounds like equal parts inspiring and terrifying to me. So I'm still like kind of on the fence. Yes, I can attest. Can I share a personal story real quick? Because this is I'm very conflicted about this response. I went on a, 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 a date like a couple of days ago, and... For some reason, we got a conversation about kids, not like, you know, our future. Well, that is quite a date. It was a very, very first, intense thing. It was the first date. Yeah. But both of us were like, why the fuck would we bring kids into this world? It's, it's, le- it's actually on fire. Like, it's actually, there are parts that are exploding. And who's going to survive? It's going to be like the Trump Aryan race. Uh, I, uh, so not our kids. I, I find it uh, somewhat a uh, concern. I mean, but um, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to tell my ambient story again. But. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Antifa, uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada, or of course, iTunes. I wherever, need to listen to this now. Hell yeah. Wherever free podcasts are sold. And <laughs> you can give us money if you want to. Uh, do you take Bitcoin? I'm kidding. Mm, I hate Bitcoin. I hate <laughs> oh my. <laughs> and, uh, uh, literary hangover. Yep, uh, patreon.com slash literary hangover. Also, check it out on YouTube. The episodes are going up there, and there might be some... Uh, I think we're going to record some bonus content for the uh, Patreon members maybe this afternoon, so hopefully it'll be up this weekend. Ooh. But uh, Sleepy Hollow coming out next uh, Saturday. Oh. Sleepy Hollow. Wow. 
Do you want to explain what the uh, podcast is? Yeah, for anybody who hasn't heard, it's a sort of it's a we read fiction. It's sort of a book club, club podcast, but with an extra eye on sort of history and politics uh, that sort of went into the formation of the book and how it was received and that sort of thing. Love that. There you go. I don't know if I ever read Sleepy Hollow. I don't know if I read it or I cliff noted or I just lied on my. It's one exams. of those stories that sort of permeated the culture so much that you've probably picked up most of the elements. Okay, that's probably it. <laughs> Oh, I, I just saw that uh, Alex. Pre- oh my gosh! Yeah. What? Whoa! What happened? Oh, let's put this up. Um. Wow. So, uh, Infowars dot com. Oh my god! There you go. Wait, I, can I take a picture of this and just? Well, it's on. Uh, oh, it's, it's on, on Twitter. Twitter. Oh my god! Uh, Infowars dot com. Has uh, has a new foil apparently. Meet the face of oh tyranny and suffering. This is uh, <laughs> this is it's pretty funny. You know, but that's concerning because Infowars is dangerous. Yeah. And yes, she's, that's true. You know, she's a very she's a very accessible, like you know, yeah. I'm actually concerned about this, especially in light of like what happened yesterday. If you think Venezuela is awesome, you'll love Alexandra Ocasio Cortez. Uh, believes in flooding America with illegals who vote, uh, overthrowing the Constitution, oh my God, this is so horrible. disarming all citizens, never-ending government handouts for all. Well, I don't that's, know that's like talking about flyers. <laughs> uh, class tribal warfare against whites, uh, government-run third-world health care. She should really go out there and promote the best health care, not third world health care. I think it's probably government monopoly. Government education. monopoly over education. Uh, I mean, I would say probably the government has a monopoly over education already. I mean, right? I mean, on some level, it's not, well, a, it's not, I don't know if you would run an antitrust case against the government in terms of uh, monopoly, but okay. I certainly Hedge wouldn't. funds? <laughs> uh, weakening police while gangs run rampant. Gangs, yeah. And then, of course, the results, uh, mass starvation, total, total brainwashing of children. <laughs> if you're going to brainwash children, folks, do it totally. Don't do it partially away. It just confuses them. Uh, the collapse of individual liberty, uh, government genocide. There you go. Man. You know, she. Wow. Could, I wonder if she could do something. Like, she's not in office yet, and she is a public figure, but I, I wonder if there's some way she can go after him legally. She's a public figure. Well, that doesn't mean you're cl- cleared. I mean, defamation, There's, there's, there are actual effects i mean if this has some sort of um, maybe there's legal experts here but defamation isn't just extinguished because of your that's public true figure. that's true i mean you would have to uh prove that when they say that she believes in right. flooding america with le- that they know that she's not uh the 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 bar would be like the you would have to prove that you know that she's not uh, believing in overthrowing the Constitution. Class tribal warfare against whites? I know that she's not. <laughs> that's probably... I think that's provable. She, I mean, listen, she won the whites. She, she won, won the, the whites. White she's vote. just she going to use them folks. to bludgeon the other whites. That's what she's going to do. <laughs> um, all right. We're going to take a break. Head into the fun half. 646-257-3920 is the number. We'll take your phone calls. We'll take your IMs. Uh, we're still working on the app. Google had some issue with our app, so uh, it, it's available if you have the Our app. ideas are being suppressed by the tech companies. Totally. We've been deplatformed. Uh, but uh, majorityapp.com. We'll be right back after this.